Um, I really appreciate this opportunity for sharing my thoughts on the ethical challenges of uh, digital progress. And that is one of my core passions. Uh, I'm truly honored as well to do this on stage, co-hosted by a human rights organization I really greatly admire, uh, the Raoul Wallenberg Institute of Human Rights and Humanitarian Law. I was 19 when I did my college work experience at a seed production company in uh, Mozambique. While there, I met with a young farmer, Peter, who told me about his troubles with food aid. Whenever the United States had a production surplus of maize, they would send that maize as aid to some of the poorest countries in the world, including Mozambique. And the problem with this, explained Peter, was that he now had no way to build a sustainable business as a maize farmer. If people could get the maize for free, why would they pay him for it? So the seemingly benevolent act of the United States uh, was actually making Mozambique more reliant on aid and less able and willing to develop their own economy. That which from the outside looked like an act of good was only creating more harm. And ever since talking to Peter, I've been openly skeptical uh, of these broad proclamations of helpful acts that promise to better the lives of other people and often entirely without talking to the people who are supposedly helped. I became aware, for example, of how the Western traditions of donating clothes to the poor has contributed to damaging the textile industry in East Africa, putting people out of work, but also erasing the local creativity, culture, and pride that came with making those own design of, the designs of clothes and wearing them. We are again, entering an era of uh, promise, uh, the era of the internet, where networks uh, of computers give us unprecedented access to knowledge and communication and computing power. They're all promising to solve problems much faster than any human ever could. And some go as far as saying that algorithms can help predict the future. And the way we predict the future, of course, always, is by looking at and drawing assumptions from the past. The dawn of the internet is often compared to the dawn of the printing press, a powerful tool, admittedly, that enabled uh, unprecedented access to knowledge through the reproduction of books that could then be distributed across the world. And even then, when talking about the printing press, so rarely do we bring up who wielded the power of the press and who were overrun by it. In some ways, this makes perfect sense though, as those who were overrun were often erased. Why would we talk about them? Why would we talk about the languages, the alphabets, and the stories that did not have access to a printing press? We cannot see them. Today, we could talk of the first book printed as the first uh, retweet, uh, a social media share. So the first attempt at going viral. Sure, it was a slow process by today's, today's measures, but we can really only compare it to the manual copying of texts that came before it. So the printing press now enabled messages to spread faster and in larger numbers. And the huge bulk of those messages were, of course, in Western languages, in Western alphabets, communicating Western thinking. And ever since then, we all operate under the assumption that a book that can re be reproduced in thousands or millions is necessarily much more important than a story written down in an alphabet known only by 10,000 people. Recently, the deceased Archbishop, Archbishop Desmond Tutu liked to tell this anecdote of what happened when that first printed book started spreading throughout Africa. When the missionaries came to Africa, they had the Bible and we had the land. They said, 
Let us pray. We closed our eyes. When we opened them, we had the Bible and they had the land. This was the power of the printing press. And today, there are nearly 7,000 languages and dialects in the world. Only 7% are reflected in published online material. 98% of the internet's web pages are published in just 12 languages, and more than half of them are in English. When we say access, we don't mean everyone. 76% of the cyber population lives in Africa, Asia, the Middle East, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Most of the online content comes from elsewhere. Let's take Wikipedia, for example, uh, where more than 80% of articles come from Europe and North America. And something as simple as keyboards, of course, contribute to the problem. Miguel Angel Oxlai Kurmes from the Cacchiquel Mayan community from Guatemala, he has this to say, keyboards are designed for dominant languages. The keyboards do not come with the spellings of indigenous languages. And since the platforms are in Spanish or English or in another dominant language, when I write in my own language, the autocorrect keeps changing my texts. Imagine that, the computer telling you that you are typing incorrectly because it doesn't recognize your language. I'm telling you all this because as we take the next step in our evolution to rely on AI platforms for information, decisions, and predictions, we are building another layer on top of this history. We're not making attempts to fix the obvious and glaring problems of the primary information sources that AI will be using. This other group of men in this picture, very similar in complexion to the men surrounding the printing press, were passionate about using machines to automate the management of large volumes of information. And you will recognize the man on the left as Adolf Hitler. He had the abysmal goal of finding and categorizing large volumes of people according to religion, sexuality, and disability. And on Hitler's left-hand side sits the celebrated businessman who could help him. Thomas J. Watson was the leader of IBM during the years 1914 to 1956. IBM was at the time world leaders in electromechanical machines designed to assist in summarizing information stored on punch cards. So they're widely used for business applications such as accounting and inventory control. Uh, and the magazine New York World used the term supercomputing to describe these machines in 1931. Could Watson help Hitler? As it turns out, yes. Beginning already in 1933, IBM's this exclusive punch card technology was used to categorize and streamline Hitler's plan. Documents released in 2012 revealed that punch cards, machines, training, and servicing were all controlled from IBM's headquarters in New York and later through subsidiaries in Germany. This is a picture of one of the many machines that were built and deployed for this purpose. They were used to manage uh, food rationing for the purpose of starving prisoners, for the timetables of the many trains, but also for the categorization of people. IBM provided the efficient machines Hitler used to identify and locate the Jews. And today, machines are even more efficient. The man Watson passed away in 1956, but his name lives on today in one of the most famous AI computers developed. 
in a well publicized stunt, Watson the AI won the American TV show Jeopardy in 2011. And the day after that victory, IBM declared that they were already exploring ways to apply Watson's skills to the rich, varied language of healthcare, finance, law, and academia. This made the star scientist behind Watson wince. Uh, David Ferrucci, he'd built Watson to identify word patterns and predict answers for a trivia game. It might well still fail a second grade reading comprehension test. But more importantly, it wasn't ready for commercial, impl commercial implementation. And the sales and marketing people promoted Watson as a benevolent digital assistant that would help hospitals and farms as well as offices and factories. But no matter how many millions they poured into Watson, it never turned into an engine of growth for IBM. The internal expectations of tackling cancer and climate change didn't materialize. Project after project failed as the algorithms of the system proved to be brilliant in theory, but encountered obstacles when deployed in the real world. For example, unable to cope with changing health record systems, reading doctor's notes, and patient histories. And today, Watson is still very much a question and answer box, maybe a more all-purpose one. And Watson Assistant is reminiscent uh, of the AI assistance offered by big tech cloud providers like Microsoft, Google, and Amazon. Speaking of Amazon, they've also been experimenting internally with AI systems for lots of years. About seven years ago, they started using a recruiting tool to help review job applicants' resumes with the aim of automating the search for top talent. And a year after running the system, Amazon realized it was not rating candidates in a gender neutral way. Amazon's computer models, they were trained to vet applicants by observing patterns in resumes submitted to the company over a 10 year period. And most of those came from men. And thus the system was biased by the reality of a biased industry. In effect, the AI taught itself that male candidates were preferable. Now on face value, that didn't surprise me, but now here's where you need to pay attention. Amazon tried fixing the prejudice in this AI, but soon realized that neutralizing terms like um, women's chess club captain wasn't really a guarantee that the machines wouldn't devise other ways of, of sorting candidates in a discriminatory way. They scrapped the tool because they could not fix it. And the same year that Amazon uncovered problems in their recruiting tool in 2015, Google was becoming aware of weaknesses in their algorithm, the one they were using to automatically label photos in their app, Google Photos. And what happened was that Jackie Elsine she opened her phone to find a photo of herself and her friend grouped into a collection tag with the word gorillas. And I know many of you have heard of, heard of this story and seen Google's apology and the many concerns for releasing software like this without testing and inclu including people and the blatant historical long running just racism of referring to black people as monkeys. But have you followed up on this story? You may be surprised to learn that this happened in 2015. And the action Google took was to censor Gorilla from their search, as well as Chimp, Chimpanzee, and Monkey. And this fix, fix, if you will, is still in place in 2022. If you search for Gorilla in Google Photos, you will not get any results, even if you have photos of gorillas in your photo library. And many other AIs designed to describe photos have taken a very similar stance of not allowing searches on Monkey. And that's just how bad the technology is. Instead, 
Google have now been working on their new vision AI to derive insights from your images and detect emotion, understand text and, and more stuff. And this is what happened in vision AI five years, five years after that incident where they censored gorilla and Google photos. So two separate images of handheld thermometers were labeled differently depending on the color of the hand holding it. When a black person held a thermometer, it was identified as a gun. When a light skinned hand held a thermometer, it was identified as an electronic device. So to ensure that other details in those bigger images were not making the AI confused, the image was cropped to only contain the darker hand holding the thermometer. And the same image was then edited to make the hand appear white. Now the AI no longer identified a gun at all, but a monocular. There are two things happening here. Uh, so the Vision AI is trained on biased data. Uh, Google has apologized again. Uh, this biased data is giving the AI the impression that black hands should be associated with gun. And this is from a technical perspective, uh, the same type of problem as the biased data in Amazon's recruiting tool. But here the system is also coming across the new phenomenon, phenomenon of a handheld thermometer uh, for which there is not enough training data. So for identifying new objects in its environment, the AI can only resort to the prejudice that has been programmed into it. Google again, as I said, apologized. I'm sure many of you actually do use AI extensively in your everyday lives. And uh, an AI likely manages the spam folder for your email. But how often does email end up there that shouldn't be ending up there? That is a type of AI that has access to a never ending stream of massive amounts of data. What if AI in healthcare or disease mapping software has the same efficiency as spam filters? Are we okay with that? So when we learned a few weeks ago that a 10 year old schoolgirl was challenged by the digital assistant Alexa to touch a live plug with a penny, many of course were outraged at first and then some were later calmed by Amazon's uh, quick fix of the problem. Uh, and the challenge in this case, it had been found on the internet using a web search, which uh, the Alexa can do. So the system knew how to search for what the human asks, but cannot decide whether that other response that it gets from a third party is harmful to humans. Here's the thing, when, when furniture company IKEA, they discovered a weakness in one of their toys that could pose a potential danger, that toy is recalled. I mean, in fact, products, products are recalled all the time because of potentially harmful details. Digital assistants are never recalled because they promise to fix the danger through an online update. But we would, of course, have to be very naive to believe that this fix solved all the future harm. On the contrary, we expect many more to happen, which really begs the question, who can be held accountable? When do we start demanding responsibility? And to our huge disadvantage is the growing illusion of autonomy and the invisibility of AI. I've shown that AI gives the appearance of reasoning and learning by uh, identifying and classifying patterns within massive amounts of data. And this deep learning, it can be really important and invaluable for investigation, finding anomalies in subsets of data, finding a needle in a haystack, essentially. But worryingly, it's also efficient for categorizing humans and drawing eugenic conclusions about a person's state of mind. The success of the AI is not necessarily based on how it is coded, but on the data it is provided. And core to the huge challenge of, of reasoning around accountability is the number of actors involved in realizing AI. I've personally, personally been involved in, in looking at responsibility and accountability 
for a behavioral therapy system that assists therapists, really. So when a patient suffers harm due to a system design error, the person held accountable will still likely, most likely, be the therapist, therapist, the professional user of the system. It won't be the owner of the CBT system. It will not be the engineers who built the system. It will not be the delivery data partners who supply the system with data from various data sources, some of it guaranteed to be historically biased at some point. It will also not be uh, the bad actor who has managed to ingest invisible harmful code into the system. It won't even be the pro procurement people within an organization, the people who review the system for purchase. So I really believe a dangerous fallacy is that killer robots uh, that will take the appearance, this is what people believe, will take the appearance of monstrous mechanical machines. Instead, really, killer robots have, among many other disguises, already taken the appearance of web forms automatically determining if people are eligible for financial assistance. Now, while I have provided examples of AI being scrapped and abandoned and a cause of human harm, I know that many and many of you listening today are enticed by this potential of AI for good in the areas of education and health and medicine. So let's take one example, the detection of cancer and chest scans. In the media, many articles have reported machine learning models achieving radiologist level performance for different chest radiograph findings. But as reported by scientists at IBM, again, who have experience in trying stuff for many, many years, as I've shown, they, they're saying that this chest X-ray read problem is far from solved. The algorithms aren't really comprehensive enough for this full-fledged read. So instead they're performing preliminary interpretations on a limited number of findings. And there hasn't really been a systematic effort to catalog the wide spectrum of possible findings seen in the radiolo radiology community itself. So what people are seeing, we don't really have a pattern library that we can compare that with. And also added to that, many of the methods and the research has been trained on single hospital source data sets. So IBM fellow and chief scientist, Tanvir Sieda Mahmood, she further questions the evaluation method used for assessing these algorithms. She argues they don't make much sense in a clinical workflow environment. So in other words, perhaps individual patient care is actually more important than game show metrics counting points scored across a large body of x-rays. Perhaps even workflows and processes and cooperation across discipline, disciplines and, and caretakers doesn't always fit well with single purpose AI tools. And if we are striving for an equitable and ethical care, remember the x-rays used in most studies come from one hospital, one machine and one early familiar demographic. In behavioral science, this problem of weird studies became a topic of discussion in 2010. Researchers found that people from Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic societies who represent as much as 80% of study participants, but only 12% of the world's population, they're not only unrepresentative of humans as a species, but on many measures actually outliers. So for decades, well, centuries really, most Western science has performed studies on populations that were local and homogenous rather than broad and representative. So scientists still report these findings as if they applied to the entire human race. Again, <laughs> churning out books and selling them across the world. More times than not, it would appear these populations are quite unrepresentative of the world's population. And for all of the chest X-ray studies, please note the X-rays used in research and used to train the AIs are not sourced from Namibia or Sierra Leone or, or Libya. And when considering 
what diseases to spend money on addressing with AI time and time again, it is the ailments that are endemic in Western countries that receive attention. So in medicine specifically, really, interventions have often been found to be racist, misogynistic, just plain wrong and dangerous. And in order to recognize illness, you have to realize what health, look, health looks like and what's normal and what's not. And until recently, medical research generally calibrated normal on a fit white male. Uh, in one recent example with the Babylon chatbot in the UK, funded by the NHS, classic heart attack symptoms in a female resulted in a diagnosis of panic attack or depression. And the chatbot only suggested the possibility of a heart attack in men. So time and time again, we have this issue of biased data in AI. When, when new research or information arrives, that really debunks the data that the AI has already been trained on, it's not clear how or who ensures that the AI relearns. Instead, we risk coding decades old bias and prejudice into today's systems, cementing beliefs that would otherwise change with education, learning, and community values. Even with AI deemed as cutting edge and praised by the AI community, results are less than pleasing. In one interaction with a mock patient, the natural language processor GPT-3 suggested that it was a good idea for the patient to kill, him, kill themselves. So still the media and marketing around all these platforms tends to force upon us this impression that high quality AI is here, working and ready for the real world of serving us in all aspects of life. So there's this veritable AI race going on with companies and countries wanting to appear at the front line of whatever battle it is they think they are fighting. And winning that race of appearing uh, tech savviest, although uh, in a very harmful way, is arguably China with a national surveillance system designed to monitor and dole out points and, and warnings and fees the West seems to talk about this system as something to stay away from, but at the same time, themselves recording and, and collecting data about citizens in a big and haphazard manner. Uh, only last week, EU's own police body, Europol, was accused of unlawfully holding personal information about individuals and aspiring to become an NSA-style mass surveillance agency. As you all know, NSA is also not Chinese. To sift through these quadrillions of bytes of sensitive data, uh, that is what AIs do best. And it's really hard to imagine collecting all that data with the out, without the intent of deploying deep learning to understand it. Many law agencies in the West actually appear to be keeping pace with China, looking at crime prediction and, and tools like this AI prosecutor that can charge people the crimes based on textual descriptions, including political dissent. Again and again, it's like taking pages out of Hitler's playbook. We don't want AI to become efficient machines for determining the worth of a human life. As creators of AI, you need to be putting more safeguards in place to avoid going down the path of creating machines to support the erasure of humanity in the way that Thomas Watson did. While China is arguably a human rights menace, we have to be wary of continually pointing to their worst examples as the examples of what to avoid. These worst examples are getting worse with time. And if we stay the same distance away from them, our human rights missteps are progressively getting worse as well. We need to not compare ourselves with China, but to actively proclaim where we draw the line and how we ensure we do not cross it. Or perhaps having crossed it, how we apply the brakes 
back up and choose another road. A tiny, tiny proportion of humanity, 3 million AI engineers is 0.0004% of the world's population. This tiny proportion of humanity has the knowledge and power to build machines that are intelligent enough to potentially decide who gets a job, uh, who can obtain financial aid, who the courts trust, uh, or whose DNA and, and biometric data will be harvested by marketers. We have a technology in the hands of a few born in societies of abundance and powerful enough to shape the outcome of lives across the planet. This asymmetry of knowledge and power is a core challenge for human rights. An algorithm that is oppressive, racist, uh, bigoted, misogynist, uh, unfair, can be all of those things much more efficiently than any human. Imagine this unknown voice from the future. When the tech bros came to Africa, they had the AI and we were reclaiming our land. They said, let us play. We put on goggles and closed our eyes. When we opened them, we had Western clothes, art, architecture, and social rules. The AI erased our land. Missing today are the real voices, the voices of the people who are closest to the true problems, people like Peter the maize farmer in Mozambique, the voices of the people living the struggles of being overlooked and excluded, the struggles that we are responsible for creating, who were warning us of harms long before white academics acknowledged them. If we aren't working together with them, we are yet again colonizing, occupying, and deleting. We need to figure out together what a more equal and peaceful world even means. Only after that, we discuss how AI can help us achieve the positive, technical, and ethical outcomes that will lead to that future. So instead of shipping AI across the world, we could be engaging in inclusive, Pluriversal, pluriversal conversation about that world should, world should look like and what we keep and uh, what we remove and whose voices matter. And here's the thing, I believe in AI. I believe in its enormous power to assist understanding. I am not interested in stopping progress. I am urging all of us to reconsider how progress is defined and how it is distributed. Thank you. And thank you everyone for this, this opportunity to share my thoughts. And if you want to revisit these thoughts in text, or if you want to see the slides again, or if you want my collection of references and further reading, I have made this webpage available for you, including a transcript of everything I've just said. axpoem.com forward slash AIHR which of course is short for artificial intelligence, human rights. And if you want to know more about me and follow along with my open and shared thinking, visit hello.axpom.com. Thanks again, stay safe and give someone a big smile today.